Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're glad to have Becca Cotto here with us this evening. Uh, she's going to give us an update on legislative initiatives under consideration in the current session of the Delaware Legislature. Um, action is underway on a broad range of issues that affect Delawareans and offer opportunities for advocacy in support or opposition. So we'll be happy to learn more about what's happening and how we can have a voice in that this evening. So Becca Cotto is the Director of Racial and Social Justice and Advocacy for the YWCA of Delaware. She has been in her position at YWCA Delaware since the summer of 2018. She's in charge of their anti-racism programming as well as advocacy. Her responsibilities include creating programming to educate the community on racial justice and equity, as well as advocating for positions YWCA Delaware prioritizes to end systemic racism. Before coming to YWCA Delaware, she was an entrepreneur and business owner for 12 years. She is a community activist, organizer, and policy enthusiast. She is often described by her family, friends, and colleagues, including me, as a passionate whirlwind. So welcome, Becca. We're so glad you could join us this evening. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm such a policy wonk that my husband bought me a sweatshirt that says, Policy is my love language. <laughs> and it's it's Ayanna Presley's um line, but I I love it. I, I bought it from her or he bought it for me. So good evening, everybody. How are you guys tonight? All right, all right. <laughs> I'm just shaking your head. Um, so I don't know how in-depth you guys are with legislation and how it moves. Um through the Delaware legislators, everybody's very familiar. I was, I have a, a PowerPoint to just kind of go through how the bills move. Um, would that be beneficial to you all? Okay, great, wonderful. Let's... I feel like I learn something new every time <laughs> we talk about it because there are lots of little details in there. I'm going to show them my spreadsheet later, and their minds are going to be blown. <laughs> so, so when they, uh, they're like, "Wait, what?" Um, all right, how do I share my screen? Oh, it's down here. I've been using Teams lately. Avita, how are you? Doing well, thank you. How are you? Good. <laughs> I'm meeting you in real life for the first time. Levita's going to be on our panel about transportation um, regarding our 21-day equity challenge. So I invited her at a recommendation, never had the pleasure of meeting her. Um, so it's nice to actually meet you. Nice to meet you too, Becca. Share screen. I'm going to play a little video. Don't everybody laugh, but let's see if it works for me. Oh, wait, hold on. You're not going to be able to hear it. Let's go back over to the Zoom. Apologies. They move things around on me in Zoom. I just want to make sure the sound works. And okay, let me stop here. Make sure. I wanted to do. Maybe it's over here. There we go. Nope. Oh my, why do I forget where this is? Oh. Sorry guys. It's not the one at the bottom of the video with the little sound icon. No, there's one that said that'll make it come through your speakers instead of mine. And I'm just trying to figure out where that is. I've used it a million times. Audio, maybe. Audio advanced. Sorry, guys. Advanced. Let me just try. Hold, stop recording. Sure. Let me try this again. Let's see what I think. I'll just. Oh, there we go. It came up. All right. That's much better. You 
sure got to climb a lot of steps to get to this Capitol building here in Washington. Well, I wonder who that sad little scrap of paper is. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Well, it's a long, long journey to the capital city. It's a long, long wait while I'm sitting in committee. But I know I'll be a law someday, at least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. Gee, Bill, you certainly have a lot of patience and courage. Well, I got this far. When I started, I wasn't even a bill. I was just an idea. Some folks back home decided they wanted a law passed, so they called their local congressman, and he said, you're right, there ought to be a law. And he sat down and wrote me out and introduced me to Congress, and I became a bill. And I'll remain a bill until they decide to make me a law. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I got as far as Capitol Hill. Well, now I'm stuck in committee, and I'll sit here and wait while a few key... Try it. I know where I left it. Sorry, guys. And I got as far as Capitol Hill. There we go. Well, now I'm stuck in committee, and I'll sit here and wait while a few key congressmen discuss and debate whether they should let me be alone. I hope and pray that they will, but today I am still just a bill. Listen to those congressmen arguing. Is all that discussion and debate about you? Yeah, I'm one of the lucky ones. Most bills never even get this far. I hope they decide to report on me favorably, otherwise I may die. Die? Yeah, die in committee. Oh, but it looks like I'm going to live. Now I go to the House of Representatives and they vote on me. If they vote yes, what happens? Then I go to the Senate and the whole thing starts all over again. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And if they vote for me on Capitol Hill, well, then I'm off to the White House where I'll wait in a line with a lot of other bills for the president to sign. And if he signs me, then I'll be along. How I hope and pray that he will. But today I am still just a bill. You mean even if the whole Congress says you should be a law, the president can still say no? Yes, that's called a veto. If the president vetoes me, I have to go back to Congress and they vote on me again, and by that time you're so By old, that time, you? it's very unlikely that you become a law. It's not easy to become a law, is it? No, but how I hope and pray that I will, but today I am still just a bill. He signed <laughs> your bill, now you're a law. Oh, yes. Just a little throwback for everyone. Were y'all able to hear that? I can't see you, so yep. you have to just... Yes, Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So um, briefly, I'm just going to kind of go the way that bills travel in Delaware, as opposed to the president. We have the governor that can sign a bill into law or veto. So bills either get drafted and introduced in the House or the Senate. They can start in either one. And when people refer to bill numbers, if they call it like HB 100, it's a bill that began in the House. And if it's SB 100, it would be a bill that began in the Senate. So the bill is introduced. Um, and then if you're lucky, leadership will refer your bill to a committee. Um, in this space, leadership has a lot of power throughout what happens to bills that legislators create. So after it's referred to a committee, it would go to a committee hearing. So for example, if there was a bill to increase teacher salaries, most likely that's gonna to go to the education committee. Now, raising teacher salaries would cause what we call a fiscal note. So before going, um, well, after going to the floor, if it is approved, so everybody says, great, teachers need a raise, it will go to a, a separate committee called appropriation. And that committee decides if we have the money to fund that particular project. Not everything obviously has a cost to it, but I think that was just easy for me to explain as far as education. So then the bill, if it doesn't go to appropriations, 
and it goes straight to the Senate and it's the same thing. It's introduced, um, then it's referred to a committee. The committee hearing, the committees have a hearing and decide whether the bill is gonna move forward or not. The bill gets read again on the floor and does the reverse. So once it goes through all of these stages, it goes to Governor currently Carney and he can choose to veto or sign it into law. Um, I believe the only bill that Governor Carney has vetoed is the marijuana bill legalization. So um, yeah, so I, I will answer any questions. If you Do you guys have any questions about that in particular? Nope. Right. Um. I do. <laughs> Please. I didn't think he vetoed that bill. I thought he just let it pass his desk, right? I'm sorry, what was that? Um, you mentioned the the marijuana bill. He did not Governor Carney didn't veto it. He just He did let the first it... time. He did the first time. Okay. okay. It went through the session before and he vetoed it. And then what happens if he vetoes it? Um, it goes back to the legislature and they can override his veto, but they need two thirds votes in those in each uh, uh, chamber. So yes, he did veto it the first time. The second time, you're right, he can ignore a bill and it will automatically become law after so many days. So that is what he eventually did do with marijuana bill because it passed two years in a row. Right. So thank you. Um, I, I like to share this story um, because this is a bill that was up not in 23, but in 22. Um, and it was a bill that basically provides um, renters with representation for eviction. So if they get a letter for eviction, they now have a resource to be able to work through that because most landlords have a lawyer or a representative um, very trained in this particular thing. So the bill went through in 2022 and it didn't pass. They couldn't get it to pass. So the um, stakeholders came together over the summer they reintroduced a different bill, made some changes, and that passed. Um, and it was a it's a great bill. Um, both Classy and Legal Aid are the are the organizations that are going to offer that representation. And while the representation may not always be a lawyer, it'll be someone well trained in that. So, I just like to say sometimes things don't go through the first time, and then eventually they do. Um, so real quick, I'm just going to talk about what advocacy is, and that's the act or process of supporting a cause or proposal. Um, and you can add, advocate for things in the legislature. You can also do things like advocate for things at your church or advocate for things um, at school for your students. I'm going to quickly go over our pillars. Um, so we have five advocacy pillars. This is the space that we spend our time in. Racial justice, housing security, economic empowerment, health and safety, and nonprofit. And for those of you that um, were here the last time I visited and I talked about everything that we do um, that most people don't know, we actually also have a home, home life sh shelter for families. We're only one of two in the state that takes families and the only one that takes young men, um, you know, teenage boys along with their family. Um, economic empowerment, we have um, mortgage classes, we have ent entrepreneurial classes, um, health and safety, we actually run SARC, which is the Sexual Assault Response Center. And then um, obviously we support anything that can help the nonprofits fund our work. Um, so those are our pillars. It doesn't mean there aren't other great things going on. This is just kind of what falls underneath our purview. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to get over all this stuff. Okay, so I will show that to you guys at the end. All right, so I would love to know, oh, we have some new people, wonderful. Um, I would love to know what what is your passion? Like, what are you curious about um, down at Legislative Hall? Like, what do you want to know what's happening? Well, I, I, I would be interested in the health issues, uh, particularly as, um, I belong to the uh, uh, chair of the health committee for the uh, state NAACP. And so uh, the health issues, health and uh, environmental issues are of concern for, for um, the constituents that I am serving. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Levita, I always go to Dustin, um, the executive director of Sierra Club for all my environmental things. <laughs> so I don't totally work on those, but healthcare and health wise definitely have some good things going on and some good things coming down the pike. Um, so there was quite a few bills, which I was surprised that needed to be written um, to make sure that Medicaid covers um, uh, mammograms, um, pap smears, ovarian, um, checking for ovarian cancer. Um, at one time, I recently that wasn't required by Medicaid. Um, also another bill passed to um, require uh, a female inmates to not require, but allow them to get mammograms as well. And um, so though that's one thing happening in health. One of the best bills, which I'll be honest with you, it disappeared but I already know about it because Senator McBride created it and I'm not sure why she took it down, but I'm sure there's a good reason. But other states do what's called um, basically um, a healthcare tax on Christiana care. So um, the, uh, most states do this. So they put a tax on everything that goes through them as far as Medicaid. They give them a percentage tax. Delaware doesn't do this yet. Um, and with that tax that we collect, the federal government matches that. So we have therefore doubled the income into our Medicaid, which is amazing when you talk about um, legislation. A doula is? Nope, okay, great. Um, a doula is, um, it, it's very uh, prominent in um, internets unstable. It's very prominent in um, black and brown communities. It's um, usually a woman that will go through your whole birthing experience with you, like, um, you know, from the beginning to the end and after you even give birth. So all of that um, was pretty much at the cost of an individual. Um, but now those things, it, it has been shown that doula improves the um, percentage of um, maternal and infant mortality rates not increases it, decreases it. Um, so that is uh, a great thing. So doulas are gonna be covered by Medicaid, um, which is amazing, as well as postpartum um, and doulas in that space as well. Um, so all of these things are um, really good things happening in the healthcare space right now. There is a contradictory bill and I'm not super educated on it, but I know we are passing it and the hospital doesn't want us to. Um, and this particular bill is about having a, basically a committee that goes over the cost, like say Christiana Care will be, will be charging us, but it doesn't have healthcare individuals on the design of the committee. So that's kind of um, the, the argument there. I, I, when I went to legislative hall last, there was tons of people in the little cloaks, they're doctors and nurses and everything, so that would be that. Um, I can just kind of, but first I want to show you guys, um, I'm going to show you my spreadsheet. So, and kind of how I do this and why it's, if it wasn't my job, it's almost impossible. Just <laughs> it's so much. Um, okay. So this is still in the works, but I figured I would show it to you so you can kind of see how we keep track. So over here on the left side, I'm not going to get into everything, but um, here's all the Senate bills so far and the assembly bills that we're following. And so uh, we've got our position down here supporting neutral. Um, sometimes we support a bill and we just watch it. Um, and that's because it already has the support. It doesn't really need our public comment or anything. Um, but when it does need our public comment, we do that. Um, we also do letters of support when legislators submit um, their actual bill if it's something that we strongly support. So right now, this is all the bills that we're watching, right? But the session is just about to rev up. So, um, so I'm just gonna stop that. But every Thursday is what's called a bill drop. So every Thursday night or over the weekend, I go to the General Assembly's website and I peruse every bill and pull out ones that are relevant to things that um, concern us or things that we're advocating for. Let me tell you about the lunch bills. So there's a couple of bills up. There's 
the Republicans have just um, wrote one to counter the Democrats one. So the Democratic bill basically gives every student free breakfast and lunch. That is the request. It got out of the committee. Um, the great thing about it getting out of committee is that particular bill wasn't supposed to get out of committee. It didn't have the votes, um, which goes to show you when you do public comment that it can sway people. Um, there was a lot of us there. And the very last person that want, went actually used a representative's kind of own words um, at them and then they switched their vote. So it's kind of interesting. That plain and simply has no budget right now. It's not in the budget. It's not gonna go anywhere other than to say, this is what we want. One of the biggest problems with the not being able to pay your lunch debt was they were withholding after school activities, graduation, um, any kind of participatory things in the school. If you didn't pay your lunch or you had student debt, you couldn't participate. So that was the motivation behind this bill. Uh, and the Republicans have just uh, re released another one and theirs covers free lunch and then it adds the reduced lunch individuals into the free lunch, but that's it. So part of it is there's still in some schools a stigma when there's still a system that differentiates who gets free lunch and who doesn't. So those are a couple of the bills. There's also another bill up just to directly state that if there's any student lunch debt, it can't hold them back from anything, meaning they're allowed to still participate in sports. I mean, you have to think to, to a lot of extent that's on the parent, right? And here's this kid who wants to play sports or wants to do extracurriculars and they're not able to because their parents either didn't fill out the paperwork or didn't, um, you know, don't give them the money for lunch or whatever the reason may be. So those are the some of the interesting bills in education. Um, housing. So housing, we have a lot going on. We do quite a bit in housing um, because we have our home life shelter. <laughs> so there was a packet last week of um, three housing bills, which were relatively incremental. Um, uh, trying to take also trying to take some of the things that COVID funded um, to continue to fund. One really good bill is um, one that basically helps homeowners who don't have the funds fix up their house so that it can't be fined or taken away or anything like that. Because um, sometimes when people retire, they don't have the same income. And, you know, if something happens to your house and you don't have the money to do it, what are you going to do? Um, so in the city, especially, that seems to be an issue of people, um, you know, getting fines and things like that. So that's one of the housing bills. Um, and the other one was like, the if you defaulted on your mortgage, um, but those are, those are just kind of small. Imp, imp did you, did you have to hoist the boat up? I bet she's not talking to me. Well, are you talking to me I, too? No, wait a minute, I'm muted. <laughs> I was like, I did not hoist the boat up. But sorry, I I I I, I I'm mu I'm unmuted and now I'm muting. Sorry, you're fine. It was funny. Don't worry about <laughs> it. <laughs> it just was so random. I was like, I don't know. Um, I'm I'm just going to share with you a little bit about, I guess, uh, kind of what legislative hall is like. Um, well, uh, last two weeks ago, we had a, a homeless bill of rights that that they have been trying to get through for twelve years now. And it can't we finally made it to committee um, this past session. And what was amazing was I went down to do public comment and I I've never been there. The entire room was packed and a lot of people with lived experiences were there to share how they had been harassed or arrested during their time that they were homeless. Um, and that's what the, this bill kind of does. It protects individuals basically from being arrested for what we might term homeless behavior, or what people might term that. Um, was a little bit sad was the, go ahead, Lynn. Wasn't that one also just sort of an anti-discrimination in terms yes. of not being able to prevent someone from accessing housing yes. and some other things due to their homeless status? Yes, 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 it is. It's a, it's a rights bill for, um, obviously, um, the homeless bill of rights. So it, it does quite a few things. Um, it doesn't fix the problem, right? And every legislator, when this bill was in the housing committee and the house of representatives, Every single one of them said, whether they were for it or against it, we know this isn't gonna fix the problem. 
but we have to do something. And it's interesting to me that we have all these legislators and they know how um, atrocious our, our unhoused rate or homeless rate is in, across the country and in Delaware. Um, we are a proponent of housing as a human right, a YW. And so when we went down for the bill, it took the, so at any given day when there's a committee, they can put one bill on the committee or five bills. It just depends on um, the committee chair and how many bills they have kind of waiting to get into queue. So when we got there, there were five bills on the agenda. They went through the first four bills, which were very minimal, not a lot of public comment, not a lot of discussion. And then they, but they still spent 40 minutes. And then they got to the Homeless Bill of Rights and the legislators started asking questions of <clears throat> the uh, sponsor. And a lot of it was, I have a business, my, my you know, my uh, constituents have businesses and homeless people stand their steps. And it was all very um, tropey and um, probably hurtful for some of the people in the room who have, you know, their life has moved past that stage. Um, but we sat there for two hours and 20 minutes and they only got through about six public comments. And I've never seen this happen before, but the legisla legislator, the head of the committee said, we're just gonna put a pause button and we're gonna come back on April 17th and we're gonna do this over, like everyone's gonna start and be able to do public comment. Well, that was good and all for me because it's my job. But the individual sitting next to me who was previously homeless has a job now and had to take off for the day, right? So there's this whole um, struggle about like, that's why I ask people that can show up at the legislative hall show up because a lot of people that the things that we fight for affect, they don't have the time. They don't, they have a family, they're working full time and it's really hard to come to Dover in the middle of the day. One of the great things is they do have um, testimony or public comment now virtually, which is a lifesaver. Um, have any of you, other than Lynn, um, given public comment before for legislation? Uh, I don't know where my raise hand button is, but this is Jill. I have. Yes. Yeah. You have. Great. Yes. For what, for what in particular? Can I ask? It was, uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, it was with the Sierra Club. So it, it was a while ago. Um, well, now I guess I for a gun thing, I think I testified in committee and I testified on the floor for um, something having to do with the uh, coastal zone, I think. Oh, wow. So that was a long time ago. Well, yeah. I mean, are you talking when they repealed it? It wasn't that long ago. It was against appealing it, repealing yes. it. Yes, yes. And so um, that the, the Coastal Zone Act, for those that don't know, uh, Governor... Yeah, Governor Peterson, who was a um, Republican governor, really cared about the environment. And he took designated sites and said, we're not going to put any more chemicals on these particular sites where no one can build on them. We're not going to do it. And so for years, we have kind of these brown sites, these things that they've tried to treat. But the legislature or someone behind them, actually, it was a Governor Carney um, initiative, wanted that repealed so that those sites could be used for continued um, manufacturing issues, despite the law. So it was repealed and I believe that two of them are now filled. One with the place that makes ink for film and that is off of Route 9. And, um, and I say ink for, I mean, ink for your printers because it, it's very chemical oriented. It's not good for the environment. It's not good for the people that live around there. And um, it's Fuji that's there. And I'm not so sure how many people paid attention to what actually moved into the space after um, after the coastal zone was repealed. So thank you, Jill, for doing that. But unfortunately, that was already pre-planned because it was Carney's first initiative. So. Um, let's see, what else can we talk about? So no one else has ever done public comment. That's great. Um, is there anything that you would consider doing public comment about? Is there anything kind of like in your heart or close to you that you, you know, you can Levita, have you done public comment? I have, uh, but not in person. I have uh, called in to, to uh, make, yeah, to uh, on the environment. Yeah. 
So that's um that's great. Well, maybe I just you... have a question. Um, Please. Uh, how often uh, are, are public comments provided on most of the bills? That's a great question. So it the legislatures form like this on Tuesdays and Wednesdays predominantly are committee days. So um, there's, I can tell you there's there's at least twenty committees between the two chambers, um, and sometimes, hold on real quick, I need to turn my light on. It's getting a little dark in here. Apologies. So usually public comment is on um, Tuesdays or Thursdays, Tuesdays or Wednesdays. Um, Thursdays are usually set aside for them to uh, vote on things on the floor. However, if they have a committee that's either um, needs extra time, they might shuffle them around and put sometimes some on Thursday mornings. Wednesdays, there's the most committees. Um, so if you want to do public comment, it's during the day usually, although the free lunch one lasted until 6 p.m. and it started at 3. So... Um, and that happens sometimes. There's bills that the legislators, they can go as long as they want to talk about it. So the sponsors there, they're talking about the bill. And then all the other legislators in the committee get to ask all the questions or say whatever they want to say. And um, and that often goes on and on for quite some time. And then they take public comment. Does that answer your question, Neil? It does. I have a follow-up. Um, when you're... Uh writing position papers or providing comments, how much research do you, does uh, the why uh, entail? How much that's research great. do you get yeah, into? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, usually, you know, it's, it's a question of like, okay, is this bill going to affect what we, you know, what we push for? And if it does, most times um, reading the bill um, can kind of tell us that. As far as research, um, by the time a bill gets to be a bill, to be very honest, it has most likely gone through, if you're a good legislator, the stakeholders. And what I mean by that, the people who were for and the people who are against it. That's the smartest way any legislator can write a bill. Because if you don't take that into account, even someone who might support your bill, for instance, people assume we're going to support every bill that has to do with, um, you know, domestic violence and sexual assault and all of that. And most times we are, but sometimes there are bills like, at one point there was a bill that it was mandatory for individuals who um, were raped to report that, they or they were trying to make that um, a law. And that's not something we would be proponents for. It's up to the individual victim, what their choice is and how they want to do it. Um, so Neil, sometimes I Google stuff. <laughs> Um, if it's a bill I know we want to support and I'm like, well, I don't quite know what to say on it. I'll Google and I'll kind of find, okay, this is good. You know, I'll pull some numbers. Almost everyone always has statistics. So I, if we can, I try to pull a story um, into it because for me and I think for the legislators, it's a little bit different for them to actually relate, right? When we're talking about homelessness or people who are unhoused, we have people at our home life shelter who have a varied experiences and we talk to them and they tell us their story. We don't use their real name or anything, but I mean, that's one of the biggest and best that um, you can do is really have a personal story um, mm -hmm. when it comes to that. Lynn, you have your hand raised. You can interrupt me anytime. No, no, I was just going to add a little more color in terms of how much, I know you didn't ask this exactly, Neil, but in terms of how much research should you do or do you need to do to make public comment? And I'll, by example, say that depending on what type of bill it is, I may have a lot of research behind what I'm going to say. Like the fines and fees reform bills is something that I spent most of my time on. So I've done the research, I have all the data. And when I go to give public comment on those, I'm trying to, as succinctly as possible, march through all the data and all the information I have because I want to make sure they, they got it all. There may be some other bills that I'm very passionate about, but I'm counting on other organizations who have done the research to help me out by giving me the talking points. 
So whether it's the ACLU or the YW or WFP or someone else has already done some of the research, put together the talking points, and I'll pick out ones that I'm passionate about, maybe can add a little color on why I feel strongly about that point or something and try to just go with what you know they've kind of hand fed me. Um, and then there may be others like the death penalty where I have no data, no talking points. I just show up to say, I just don't want this to happen in our state. Please don't do it. You know, <laughs> no data, no nothing. I'm just sharing how I feel about something. Mm -hmm. And I feel that's perfectly legitimate too. You know, I don't have to have data to speak up and say, I just don't want our state to do this. Um, so it kind of gives you the full spectrum of what you can do in public comment. You can be chock full of data, or you can just make it an emotional, you know, plea for what you care about. And all yeah. of that is perfectly, you know, good and helpful. Yeah. And then and you don't have a lot of time to do it either. Yes. Let me tell you. Okay. So it's supposed to be two minutes. There are some chairs that only allow you one minute. So when I write a two minute one and they're like, you have one minute, I'm like, I don't even know what to cut out of this. Because I practice two minutes and it doesn't make much sense without it. But um, so that's one of the one of the things. There's only one or two minutes. So it's a lot of time spent, right, for this two minutes to just say, this is where we stand. This is why we support or don't support. And I'm not sure if I said that. There are obviously things like Lynn just mentioned, like the death penalty, where you would make public comment against the bill. And there are a lot of bills that that happens with. One of the new things some of the legislators have started to do, and I feel like we're throwing back to the 90s, is adding additional crimes for something that's already crime. So, for example, and, and all that does is add penalties. It stacks things up for individuals um, who are struggling. And so a lot of us will come out and say, don't we don't want you to we don't want you to make a felony because someone took a porch pack package like you know porch pirates i'm not saying that they're wonderful to have it happen to you we're just saying you can't really punish people doing that um it's hard to do first of all and second of all it's already against the law like that's the thing is all these laws are already on the books so adding additional things to it doesn't make a lot of sense when we're trying to reduce our prison population which we have um since i not me personally but since i started this job Delaware's prison population has decreased. So, um, which is a good thing because we have more people in prison than any country in the world, which is a bit insane, even China. So, I, I can't find my raise um, hand. You thing. don't have to, Jill. There's only so like eight of us on here. Don't worry about do, it. Do, do. I, I'm annoyed that I can't find it. Um, I'm on my phone and not on my thing. Um, do you endorse candidates? We do not. We are a 501C, so we cannot endorse candidates. Um, and this year, I, and I'm grateful, I have a new CEO who's allowed um, me and our organization to step into the advocacy space. We really used to be behind the scenes, going to all the meetings, you know, trying to tell people on the down low. But now my new CEO is 100% on board for advocacy. The one thing we can't do legally is endorse candidates. Um, However, we can have candidate forums, which we're planning for this uh, year. This will be the first time we do that. And we can have, um, we can do topics as well. So we could do, um, and a lot of YWs across the country are doing pro-choice in their states right now. And it's a, obviously it's a big deal. Um, but all of the YWs have been, you know, that are in those states have been working that. And that's an issue campaign, right? So you don't come out and say, you know, I don't know, Brian Pettyjohn is against abortion. You say, if you support abortion, you should find the candidate that also, you know, if that's an important issue that also mirrors that. So um, I don't know if that helps still, but. That is, that's, I mean, that's then you just have people, uh, I look forward to hearing about your candidate forums. I think that's, I I, I know the, the demo, the, Democratic candidate forum for it was like what was it in March that was um, in Lantana Square someplace was very well received so people learned a lot yeah they are um, 
so um Lynn, you threw me off. <laughs> uh no, it's okay. It's okay. Um I will I will get to those before we 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 let go because that's really okay. um uh, I, I'm assuming, Becca, that you don't um, uh, voting rights. That's that's not within your pillar system. One hundred percent. So that comes under um, racial justice for us, because um, as we know throughout history and it continues, um, voter suppression is concentrated on um, low income and people of color um, throughout our country. It's it's the history of our country. And I don't know. You guys have all sat through Sue's thing, right? Have you gone through Sue's thing? Well, one of the things that I found fascinating is during the time of Reconstruction, I never knew this, there were more Black legislators than today than have been yet. We have not matched Reconstruction numbers um, for legislators of color, which blows my mind. Obviously, the minute that was a thing, voter suppression started hardcore, um, you know, uh, all the the rules that you had to follow to be able to vote, you had to read, you had to do this, that, and the other, all of those came quickly um, and ended Reconstruction, right, and ended the power of the people. So uh, criminal justice reform. This is this is my passion. Um, and we don't have a ton actually going on with this, but one of the biggest bills we have is probation reform. Because one of the things that people get um, reincarcerated for, not one of the things, are really, um, some of the things are really um, trivial, such as being late, um, a missing an appointment, which these are things I think everybody does, but when you don't have um, reliable transportation, right, and you're trying to get to a job, and you're, sometimes those things happen and there's not this, this grace for individuals. Um, to, if they get technical, they're called technical violations. So that's one of the biggest things is not allowing technical violations to reincarcerate people it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense just society wise, but also for individuals. Um, Lynn, what else do we have going on in criminal justice? <laughs> I'm like blanking it. Oh, um, one of them that is coming down the pike and they're looking for supporters for, but has not been introduced quite yet, although it should be soon, is a police reform bill. So remember, there was a version of. Are they? Are they? Oh, you're talking about the bill, the to um, make this is to give public defenders access yes. to police misconduct records. Um, that currently civil attorneys do get access to those same records if they are, you know, suing the the police. They can get access to those records, but the public defenders who are trying to defend someone does not get access to those records to be able to say that, well, the police officers who is accusing my client, you know, has a history of lying, planting evidence, whatever it may be, they're not allowed to get access to those uh, misconduct records currently. And so this bill would give them access. To or the video, like, for example, when their client is arrested, what actually went down, they are not allowed to have access to that video right now. Um, he went on a mission with this. So this is one of our losses four years ago to reform um, uh, this um, uh, prison reform. And we really beat down quite a bit. And we wanted everyone to have access to misconduct records and didn't think any anyone should really, anything should be really hidden. It should be transparent. Um, and that was like thrown out <laughs> twice, three times. I don't know, got pulled off of every bill we submitted. And so they don't even have, you know, the new one that's coming up will at least give defense attorneys that that opportunity, which is good. But my point always has been is that dead men and women don't have lawyers. Um, their family might have a civil lawyer, but then they get to actually see the footage and all of those kinds of things. But if someone doesn't have that family surrounding them. No one ever really knows what happened because no one's fighting to see the video um, and we don't offer it up. So. So what else got going on? Not even in discovery is not offered up. Just... That's only for civil attorneys. Um, the public defenders or the um, defense attorneys do not get access to police misconduct records as part of discovery. No, I mean the arrest. Oh. The video. Yeah, the video. I don't know the answer to that. I don't either. Get back to you, Neil. <laughs> okay. 
I will. I will. Um, access to the rest videos. That was another bill that passed is actually supposedly in the state of Delaware. It's a requirement for any police um, organization, because there's various ones throughout the state, um, to have body cameras. That's a law in Delaware. They all still don't have them. Um, you know, it's it's hard to actually enforce laws like that. Um, you know, it's recommended. It's put in the budget. I don't really know what they're going to do for. I, I think the ones who haven't done it yet say they, you know, it's funding. It's, you know, this, that and the other. Um, I will say there um, will be um, several uh, fines and fees reform bills that um, have not been introduced. They don't have numbers yet, but they will be introduced in the Senate shortly. And so they are some additional um, fee elimination bills. So that <coughs> these fees that get stacked on top of pun punitive fines in the criminal justice system, this will eliminate some more of those. Um, also to death penalty bills, believe it or not. Um, you're right. Or against, right? <laughs> no, no, both oh. of them to eliminate the death penalty. So right now the Supreme Court has ruled that the, um, the way that they were doing it was unconstitutional, but Delaware still has the death penalty on its books. So this session, two bills already have been introduced. One of them repeals um, Delaware's legislative ability to do the death penalty. <clears throat> and the second one is the first stage of a constitutional amendment to actually put in our constitution um, to not allow the death penalty. So both of those bills have been introduced this session and there is an active campaign to um, get supporters to sign on um, to a letter. And um, some of you both, I think Neil and Leveda at least will be getting um, an email from me shortly because I'm trying to get more faith-based um, organizations and leaders to um, sign on to that. Uh, so you'll be hearing from me on that shortly. Great. And then who's it. heading that up? Who's heading Charlie. up the um, project to well, it's get been, those? Yeah, um, Kevin O'Connell from um, the Public Defender's Office is kind of taking the charge on the advocacy side. Um, Representative Sean Lynn is the prime sponsor of both of okay. those. Um, and we actually have, I don't think it's been um, announced yet because it hasn't gone in the newsletter yet, but Kevin O'Connell will actually be our Thursday speaker on April, um, not the... April something. April 18th, I believe. Oh, April 18th. April 18th okay. will be Kevin O'Connell speaking about the history of the death penalty in Delaware and what these um, new bills will do. Yeah. So, so does it do any good to get ahead of that and, and write to your representative and senator at this point and individually state your, I'm not a faith-based faith -based person, but it's, just writing folks? I think you it, yeah, there's never, a, it's never too early, you know, once these bills are introduced, but even when bills haven't been introduced, letting them know how you feel and that to be on the lookout for something, it's never too early to talk to your own um senator and representative yeah absolutely um and i do if you all have never met your legislator um one of the things i really encourage you to do is um get to know them almost all of them will meet with constituents um because what's really helpful is let's say um we are going to um talk about the bill that lynn just did and we need to talk to a legislator in jill's district and jill's like i'm totally against the death penalty my legislator's on the line. I know your legislator's not on the line, Joe, but if they're not decided, <laughs> um, <clears throat> if they're not decided, um, you know, Don't knowing that, Is that right? Do you know where he is on that? Who? My, oh, I my thought you Smith. had Sarah McBride. Who's your legislator? Oh, Senator. No, no, I'm, I'm uh, Spiros Montevinos and um, Mike Smith. Oh, well, then I don't know. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, yeah, that's that's good. Good. Uh, good to ask. Do you have a relationship with them? Uh, yes. Good. Good. Um, Spiros Matnovos, and I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. 
he's been doing amazing work with the um with what do we call i don't even there, there's a new term health care and al alzheimer's stuff yeah retired people like people yeah. who um aging in place and and things like that he had a task force mm -hmm. and now he's pushing those bills through it's not something we really focus on but he's doing a great job in that space so mm -hmm. that's something you know that you care about he's someone you maybe get on his uh email list or something like mm -hmm. that one of the things that we started this year is um act actually um advocacy alerts so we haven't used it yet because we're reserving the alert for when we absolutely need bodies. But what we're going to start doing when Legislative Hall comes back is we're going to do a weekly. This is what happened last week, and this is what's coming this week, so that people kind of know. Because I don't need to send a 911 for every public comment, right? Like, that would kill you guys. <laughs> so it's really, there's going to be an email summarizing things, and then if you want the action alerts, You'd sign up. We can send them via text and email or just one or the other if that would be your preference. I'll, I'm going to give you guys that link if you want to sign up um, to do that. Because honestly, you I think you guys kind of saw what I did before I did this part of my job. I was always trying to catch up because it is hard <laughs> because people are doing things that like Lynn, I knew that they were working on that. I didn't think that bill was going to be for this year. Um, so sometimes you know things are happening. But there's other things happening behind the scenes. If the police or the unions come out against a bill that, let's say, progressives might be more for, um, that's always kind of a, a catch-22 for legislators because they're too, you know, if you're a progressive legislator, you really support unions, um, but unions are also really strong when they come at you and they don't support something. So, you know, um, that's one of the things I think... Uh, legislators make mistakes on is they don't have every voice in the room. Although we tried really hard with the, <laughs> with the uh, police reform bill um, to have them in the room, but is there, yes, yes, Lynn, that's a great one. There is also a bill to create um, an inspector general in Delaware um, who would be um, separate from the party um, so they would be an individual. So I think this stemmed from what happened with, uh, Kathy McGinnis and the fact that she was the auditor and her job was to audit and she would have been auditing herself with the budget, not all the things that were going wrong there. So everyone's like, we need someone that doesn't actually have a job in the government that their just job is to be the watchdog. So I, I we think that has the support to go through, um, it doesn't need two thirds majority. And I believe that almost every Democrat's in support of that. So that would push that um, over, hopefully. Anything else, Lynn? Lynn's given me all the ones I forgot about. Look at you. Um, any environmental justice bills? That yeah, that's what I was going to say. I That's one I don't know. Um, unless we're talking about, like, there are some, when they were doing the, um, oh my gosh, and I don't think it went anywhere. Lavita, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, like the perimeter of um, around perimeters of certain neighborhoods, you couldn't have like a certain percentage or it yeah. could be a certain distance. Is that ringing a bell to you? Um, it, it, it does. I can't recall what that is. Um, oh, it's an impact it, bill or something. Yes, that sounds yeah. like it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Sally. You're mute. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, cumulative impacts bill that, that some folks are working very hard on. Uh, Lynn, thanks for the setup for that. Um, yeah, which which um, would say if you've got a new new factory you want to build, um, you can't just look at the impact of that factory. You've got to look at the, that impact in conjunction with all the other pollutants that are that are going on there. I, I think that will be introduced pretty soon. Um, I, don't, I, I know Representative Lambert has been working on that since he was elected <clears throat> mm -hmm. and, um, it, it's, it's a, a hard bill because again, you also have, um, while I call myself, I'm, re I'm a registered lobbyist. Um, and you, and I used to always think that was a bad word. Um, but now I've moved to lobbyists for hire to the bad word. <laughs> and then there's, um, lobbyists like myself that, that stand for a particular, um, uh, platform, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. Like, for instance, Sierra Club, they only, you know, advocate for all the great environmental bills, right? That's their space. Um, 
<laughs> and so most of the nonprofits have a lobbyist um, representative. It's the legal way to do it. So, Liz? You just went on mute. Say that again. Right I did. Or at least I didn't hear it come through your last question. Oh, I, I said, are you registered as a lobbyist? Oh, I am not. Yeah, you wouldn't have to be. I'm just a citizen advocate. Yes. Yes, you are. And and Linda is oh. an amazing one. I will say that. So can you it's provide okay. clarity to your last comment? Um, I know uh, 501c3s can't be partisan organizations. They can't mm -hmm. be candidates. But are you also saying that they cannot opine uh, on legislature? They need a lobbyist to do that for them? Um, no, but Delaware, no, they don't need a lobbyist. Um, I did this my first year, just a little bit here and there, and I wasn't a registered lobbyist. But um, as a 501c, this is just learning, I'm sorry. There's a, there's a only a small portion of our income that we can use towards what's called lobbying. So um, like only, I think like under 20% of my salary, basically that time can be spent in that space lobbying. Um, but we also have to report that to the IRS. So to do that, we need to kind of keep track of it. And Delaware requires you, if you're gonna do the, the federal form to be a registered lobbyist. So it's kind of, yeah. And every state is different. So some states you don't act, you don't have to be a lobbyist to do a lot of what I do. But 501c3s, you're right, can only do a limited amount of lobbying. But lobbying is when you are um, advocating for a specific bill. Mm -hmm. If you're doing general education and advocating for a general platform, that's not lobbying. You know, you can say you are, you know, uh, you know, pro-choice and want to educate people about why pro-choice is a good thing. And as long as you're not talking about a specific bill that you're asking a legislator to pass, it's okay. You can spend all the time you want talking about that. So, you know, there's a limited definition of what lobbying is in that sense. Yeah. I mean, I used to have all these ideas about what a lobbyist was like. Um, I am going to give you guys real quick. Yeah, just to late. keep an eye on the clock, it is 8.02. Yes. And so um, we should probably switch it up to Q&A unless there's something else that you want to get in before we switch to purely Q&A. No. Nope. That's not what you guys need. Does anyone have any questions they would like to ask Becca while we have her? Yeah, I, I have a quick question that kind of straddles the criminal justice and voting accent, uh, access. I, I, I think it was... Uh, we go shoot. back to voting when we're done. Go ahead. How, how do uh, folks who are in jail, uh, who may not even have been adjudicated have, as being convicted, um, don't have access to voting? Is What's happening around that? That's a lawsuit right now. So that's a lawsuit. Okay that the ACLU is Is taking on. ACLU, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so okay. because that's a lawsuit, no one's really messing in the policy to see, we're gonna see how that turns out. Um, but yes, it's completely illegal um, because mm. they're not, they're people. everyone in pretrial pre has no access to voting and they mm. don't allow mail-in voting. So um, you did ask about voting. Two things I wanna tell you, Jill. One, um, we have started a Get Out the Vote Coalition and um, it is, and I'll put that link in here too, but it's basically okay. like all of us, like ACLU, Metropolitan Wilmington Urban League, um, oh my goodness, uh, the Delaware Racial Justice Collaborative, all of us working mm. together um, to come up with a plan on where where are the people that aren't registered? One of our partners is Children's and mm. Family First, and they run all the Head Starts downstate. I mean, me personally, a place to meet people is when they're dropping off their kids because that's the only five minutes you may get, right? right. So um, I think that's one of our big initiatives. So we're going to move from that. We're going to that the Get Out the Vote Coalition is also going to plan the candidate forums. Um, and we're actually going to do Get Out the Vote, you know, make phone calls, send postcards, et cetera. Mm. And the legal women voter stuff, well, they do a lot of yes, voter registration too. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Le mm. Actually, I mm. should say that. Of course, they were the first people I went to. So they're mm. in. 
they're always in. They're great. And so obviously you work pretty much in Delaware. I do. I do. Okay. I do work in Delaware. So SB, I know you're saying that we should go to Pennsylvania. I know what you're going to say, but I'm nonpartisan. Um, right. I just encourage everyone to vote. Um, but there is a bill, um, uh, Senate Bill 3, um, which allows, I believe it's mail-in voting. Um, but we need two thirds in the House and the Senate for two years in a row because it's a constitutional amendment they're trying to get passed. So that means it has to pass um, this session, right? And then again, next session, which is, you know, they go like this, this this session was 23 and 24, you know, 2023 20, and 24. And next session will be like, I guess the end of 24, 25. Um, yeah. So it has to fail no, the, two, the next two general assemblies. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and last time we've got this through one year and then the election happened and the Republican legislators that were on the bill wouldn't vote for it the second time. So that burned, but there's a new bill up Senate bill three. I believe it's Senator Gary's Brown's bill. Um, and it's, I think it's mail-in voting. Any other questions? All right, seeing none, I will say thank you very much, Becca. This is very helpful. Hopefully that gave some folks an idea of not only how Delaware's, how bills go through the system, how you can help advocate for them, but also some of the specific ones to keep your eye on this session. Um, if you're not on YWCA's um, distribution list, um, you should be because, as Becca said, they will be sending out alerts for some of these. Um, but, you know, pick your passion area. And I'm sure there's an organization that is sending out alerts on those bills. So if you want to know about what's happening in, you know, environmental, you know, justice, get on the Sierra Club's mailing list or whoever it may be. There are people out there who will keep you informed so that you don't have to stay on top of it all yourself. There are others out there doing the work and will alert you so you can show up when your voice needs to be heard. Right. And people often ask me, um, you know, as the director of racial and social justice, obviously I'm a white person. So often people say to me, what can I do? Right. What can I do? What can I do? And I know it seems simple, but knowing your legislator and being able to make a phone call or an email is beyond important when it comes to racial justice. It's like the reason the Jim Crow, they were laws, right? They were laws on the books. So for us to change things, we need to pass good laws and make sure we don't hit all these unintended consequences. I'm not sure if mass incarceration was intended to be mass incarceration, but it was definitely intended to get people that smoked pot or crack off the street. I mean, it was crazy. So many people went to jail during that time frame and it's still there. <clears throat> so that is the link um, for signing up for alerts, but I'm also gonna give you the link if you wanna be part of our Get Out the Vote Coalition. Um, which can be anything from registering voters or helping plan um, things. So, so jump it around. And I want to channel my inner Sue Linderman. I think she already did it, um, but some of you may not have been here. Next week's speaker is from the Delaware Historical Society. Um, and I think I have some more information I can say about that, hopefully. You will be able to tune in. Delaware Historical Society marks 70 years since the Brown versus Board of Education decision. And that'll be with the executive director, Evan, um, Ivan Henderson and board member, Karen Ingram. So I hope many of you will be able to come back next Thursday to join us again to hear about that. Yeah, Ivan is amazing. Um, the work, I, I hope he doesn't leave us. This, this other link I'm putting in here is for the Get Out the Vote Coalition. Um, so the first one is if you want to sign up for alerts, the second one's for Get Out the Vote Coalition. Um, and, and I agree. I think the easiest thing to do is is get on a list, even if you're on a bunch of lists. But I mean, I don't know your opportunity, but even calling down to Dover is great. If you've never been to a lobby day and you care about housing, on May 9th, there's actually buses going down because
to say more. Can you hear me? There we go. I'm back. Um, uh, there's actually buses going down because um, the housing lines, Delaware is paying for them and they want a lot of people with lived experience, but it's housing day down at Legislative Hall, May 9th. So it's everything housing. And if you tell the Housing Alliance Delaware that you're coming, they'll put you in the appointment with your legislators, with other people. So if you haven't done that and you're a little anxious, May 9th is a great time to do that. And I don't have the link. I will send the link to Lynn about that information if uh, if anybody's interested. But that's a kind of a fun way to learn the first time is, you know, you there's tons of people there and, you know, so if you care about housing, that's a good day to go. All right. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Okay, cool. Thanks again, Becca. Really enjoyed having you back again so soon. And thank you, everyone who came tonight. Have a great oh, rest of your evening. I, hold on real quick. I just want to, real quick, I want to plug our Let's Talk. So every Monday, starting next Monday, we're going to have what we call Let's Talks around our racial justice challenge. And like I mentioned, LaVita is going to be on. She's on our very last panel, which is... Um, April 29th, um, but coming up this Monday, we have one on reproductive justice. Um, and on the 15th, we have uh, financial empowerment. And on the 22nd, we have gun violence. And then um, the last one is transportation. And they all intersect with race. That's all of these are, you know, in that space of, of how that affects individuals. So. Becca, um, is your uh, email that, uh in the uh was included in the email that Lance sent out i don't know my guess is not i don't think but it I... was if you want to put it in the chat real quick Becca. yeah yeah it's easy thank you sure yes anyone feel free um i'd love to talk I, if i know your legislator i'll definitely do an intro um the I, funny thing is that now like some of my friends way before they were ever near legislative hall are now legislators. So it's kind of cool <laughs> to be like, I knew you when, <laughs> I knew you when you were silly and not a legislator. So, <laughs> all right, guys, we'll have a great evening and hopefully I'll see you guys again soon and you can keep plugged in and doing some work, doing good work. All right. Thank, Thank you, Becca. You're welcome. Good night. Thank you, Becca. Good night. Good night.